Hi everyone, thank you for joining this tutorial. So today's tutorial is a hematological tutorial given today by Dr. Chong. But just before we do that, we've got the BMA sponsoring this talk and we're proud to have them sponsoring the talk. So we've got Tim who will be giving a brief 10 minutes talk about how the BMA can support you as medical students and sort of giving you reasons as to why to join the BMA. Um, Tim, you can take it from here. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, welcome to this short presentation. I'm going to outline how the BMA supports you throughout medical school and particularly your final years at med school. My name is Tim Combley. I'm one of the BMA's membership managers. I cover East London and North Kent, but um, my colleagues cover the whole countries. There's seven of me across the country supporting doctors and students on a local level. So who is the BMA? Uh, the British Medical Association is the trade union and professional association for doctors and med students in the UK. The BMA was set up by doctors for doctors and we have collective bargaining rights which we use to negotiate the national contracts for all doctors. When we sit round the table with the government they listen to us as we represent the profession in vast numbers. The more members we have, the more representative we are, and the more bargaining power we have. The Medical Students Committee represents medical students in the UK. We consider and address issues of importance to med students and make sure your views are represented in wider BMA policy. We continuously fight for the profession locally, regionally, and at national level to help to improve your working lives and provide you with the support that you need to work to the best of your ability. We also offer employment support and career advice for our 160,000 members. Regardless of where you are in your career, the BMA is here to help guide you. Now I'll take you through some of the BMA's top membership benefits for students. Firstly, being a member of the BMA allows you to access the BMA library. This is the biggest medical library in Europe. Uh, I'm hoping that we have some London based listeners here who are aware that during normal conditions, you can use our library facilities as a study space. Um, not to worry if you're not based in London. Before the COVID-19 um, pandemic, the BMA offered a free postal service to all members up until the end of FY2, so you can access the books remotely using the postal service. This will resume when we're allowed to do so. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly when that will be, but hopefully it will be in the coming weeks. At the moment, if you want an e-book e and we haven't got it, our library team will try and get it for you. So please email them if you need to access one of the e-books. When we're not in the pandemic, you can borrow up to 12 books at a time from us for up to 12 months. I'm told this is more generous loan out terms than any university, and we don't have any penalties if you return the book late. We all know how expensive medical textbooks can be, and you'll never need to buy one again um, if you're a member of the BMA and you'll have access to the BMA library. You can also access over 22 million journal articles, research services, ebooks and e-journals anywhere, anytime. Another important membership benefit is the world famous British Medical Journal. If you're a final year med student and in membership, you can now upgrade to the full BMJ if you haven't already done so. You'll receive the journal every week through the post or you can access it digitally on the app if you prefer. As part of your free BMJ learning subscription, you get access to thousands of clinical e-learning modules. The, these are really useful courses, both for your exam revision and completing your e-portfolio when you begin your foundation years. You'll see a few examples of the courses on this slide. You can build your knowledge with our interactive website, including audio and video modules to help you learn in simulated environments. You can keep up to date with practice changing developments with one of the world's largest and trusted online CPD providers for doctors and med students. You can also print and download the certificates as proof of your learning. The BMJ also provides support for your non-clinical skills. You can access courses that help with your medical CV and career planning. Also make sure that you hit the ward running by completing our courses on workload and time management, 
effective handovers, building professional relationships, and giving and receiving useful feedback. We also provide courses on interviews, presenting, and negotiation skills. You can use your BMA login to access all of these courses. Other key student benefits include discounts on Ask Dr. Clark revisions, facilitated by Dr. Bob Clark and his team. They are the UK's most popular revision courses. We can also help with planning and organizing electives and practice questions and online resources to help you with your SJT. Another extremely important thing to know is that the BMA offers a counseling and peer support service. Doctors and med students are humans too. And whether it be exam stress, anxiety, relationship issues, etc., there is always somebody you can talk to. You can call our wellbeing team 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you're on your first placement or you're newly qualified and you don't know who to turn to, the BMA can help. You can speak confidentially to a fellow doctor and BMA member who has been trained in peer support. As a student member in any year, you can access our exciting new tool, uh, the Specialty Explorer. Help with making an informed choice about your specialty. It's an online psychometric test, which takes about 20 minutes to complete, and it asks all sorts of work um, life balance questions. It supports your research into medical specialties and provides you with a very detailed and personal report, listing your top 10 specialties according to your answers. It's quick, easy to use and covers all specialties in the UK. It is of course a guide, um, but our student members and uh, junior doctor members say that it's a really, really useful tool. In the specialty is a very detailed report. It's 20 pages all about how it works out your top 10 specialties and matches your answers. It will ask you questions about how important location is to you, earning potential, if you prefer a hospital or community setting, and even how competitive you are. It also asks if you prefer to work with patients who are acutely ill or chronically ill. So to recap, if you are already a member or when you do join us, we strongly recommend that you register your BMA account to access all the benefits. You'll receive emails that will keep you informed on political updates, guidance and resources. Please also follow us on social media for instant updates. Um, we currently have an offer at the moment where you can join today and pay no membership fees until October. So there really has never been a better time to join. Now that is um, about it from me. Um, if you'd like to join and be able to have a say in your chosen profession, simply click or well, simply visit the link on this presentation. You should be able to see it on your screen there. You should also be able to see a QR code. So if you hold your smartphone camera up to that, it will take you straight to the uh, to the joining page. If not, please join using that um, link that you can see. And if you use that link, you'll get access to the uh, to the discount. If you've got any questions, I mean, we might have a bit of time now uh, to see if I can answer any questions you might have. If we don't, please do take down my email address there because you'll be able to, uh, to contact me via email with any questions you might have. Do follow me on Twitter as well. I'll post regular updates about membership and what's going on. Um, and that uh, Twitter account again for the BMA students is on your screen. So again, follow that. Um, Let's see if we do uh, do have any time for, for questions. Right, okay, I'm going to um, assume that the silence means there is no questions. Um, and yeah, you know, if, oh, let's see. Oh, there's some in the chat, okay. Okay, I think that I don't think there's any questions. So we're just going to go straight to the tutorial. Thanks so much for um, for listening. Um, it's been really great to talk to you. Like I said, uh, please do consider joining. Um, we're really helpful for med students and doctors. And that's it from me. Thanks very much. Hi, guys. So the hematological tutorial will begin soon, but just a few rules. If you're watching via Zoom, any questions or comments for things that are covered in the moment, if you just want to pop it into the chat, 
and any questions that can wait to the end if you just want to put it into the q a if you're watching on the facebook live just comment your questions or your comments and we'll pass them on to the teacher on the zoom and that's all for me we're just waiting for the tutor anthony to just share a screen and then we should be good to go thanks And just want to say a quick thank you to the BMA for supporting this tutorial and hand over to Anthony. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, awesome, cool. Um, okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, if you just want a slideshow, should be good. Cool. So let's start. Okay, so hi everyone. My name's Anthony. Um, I'm a junior doctor in London. Um, and yeah, I've just done a PowerPoint on what well, a little tutorial on anemias and polycythemia. Um, yep, so just to let you know, I'm the one who made this PowerPoint. Um, so take everything I say with a, with a pinch of salt. But hopefully, I did do a hematology BSc uh, at Imperial, so I hope I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so the main learning objectives is basically uh, to learn about microcystic, normocystic, and macrocystic anemias, um, and also a bit about polycythemia. So first, um, anemias, um, let's see. So the definition of anemia, um, well, the definition varies depending uh, on the gender you are and whether you're pregnant or not. Um, and that is because um, when, well, firstly, men are normally heavier than women, so have more blood in the body. Therefore, they have a higher threshold for anemia. And also, when you are pregnant, um, you are more likely to get a dilutional anemia as you get more fluid production. So that's why there's different thresholds. So some basic classifications. You can, there's a few ways you can classify anemia. Um, one is by the size of the red blood cells. So hence microcystic, normocystic, macrocystic. And macrocystic can, off, uh, can be split into megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic. And megaloblastic um, is basically characterized by folate or B12 deficiency. And you can also get hemolytic anemias. Um, and there's a few types, but the ones I'll focus on today will be the microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. So uh, microcystic anemias. Um, so there's a few different causes, beta fat, thalassemia, alpha anemia, iron deficiency anemia, anemia of chronic disease. Um, and let's see. Okay, so we'll just go through them one by one. So beta thalassemia um, is basically, well, what you need to know as well, medical students is it's decreased or absent synthesis of the beta globin. Uh, normally in the Mediterranean, um, in the Mediterranean and Middle East, and there's a few different types. So you can either be a carrier, so you can split it by genotype, so you can be heterozygous or homozygous, uh, or you can split it phenotypically, um, and that determines the severity of the anemia. So um, a bit about the pathophysiology. Uh -huh. In beta thalassemia, um, you get deficient or absent production of the beta globin chains, and that imbalance leads to precipitation of excess alpha chains um, in the red blood cells. And this excess precipitation results in membrane damage uh, and red blood cell destruction, which is why you get the anemia. Um, and because these defective red blood cells 
are getting removed from the system. You're getting ineffective uh, erythropoiesis. And because of that, you get a compensatory erythroid hyperplasia. Okay, so the clinical features. So in beta valve trait, you can be asymptomatic. Um, it's quite common to be asymptomatic, or you can have mild pallor, and that's just caused by the anemia. And in intermediate uh, slash major, there's a few um, key features that may be helpful in SBAs. So hepatic splenomegaly, which, of, which often manifests as abdominal distension, uh, failure to gain weight. Uh, in this picture, uh, I think what's most obvious is what a chipmunk face is uh, and a large head with frontal and parietal bossing. So the forehead becomes quite prominent and unfortunately you get, you look slightly like a chipmunk, which is the chipmunk faces. Okay. And beta fat semen. So uh, the investigations, well, in terms of bloods, you could do a full blood count, of course, a peripheral blood smear, uh, which you will see microcytic red blood cells. You can also see dacrocytes, which are red blood cells, which are in the shape of teardrops. And um, you can also see microspherocytes. So these are just shaped as a circle and they're smaller than the typical red blood cell. Target cells, uh, schistocytes, which are fragments of red blood cells. And you also get a large number of nucleated red blood cells. Um, and that's because the body is trying to make more red blood cells to replace all the ones uh, that are getting destroyed. Uh, so therefore the reticular site count is raised. So I'm not sure how clear this image is, um, but this is a blood film of someone with beta thalassemia major. Um, so what we can see here is so these red blood cells, they're not normal because you can see a large amount of whites in them and that's called hyperchromia. So you've lost um, some of the coloration in the red blood cells. That's why so many of them have large areas of white. Um, and we can also see some variation in size uh, because you've got a few, so we've got some larger ones and we also have some smaller ones. And variation in size is anisocytosis and the variation shape, because you can see a few of these, of, they're not all similar shaped. Uh, variation in shape is poikilocytosis. Um, and also you can see some nucleated red blood cells. So that's the ones with uh, a small purple dot in them. So these ones are nucleated. So the immature red blood cells. Okay, so uh, what is diagnostic of beta thalassemia is hemoglobin electrophoresis. It separates um, the hemoglobin into its different types. So I think it's quite important to know um, the one for major, as oh, as it does come it does come up in exam questions. Um, so if we think about the pathophysiology you're lacking beta globins and HBA is, oh, sorry, you're, you're lacking beta globins and HBA is made from two alpha and two beta globin chains. So therefore you're gonna get very little HBA because you're lacking the beta chain. So you can't make HBA. And, and from there uh, you get an excess of the other two. So you get an excess of HBF and HBA2 um, is a relative so these are raised relative to the HBA. And then because major is the most um, severe, you're gonna get the least HBA. Um, we also get some LFT dysfunction as well, which um, is also important to note. Uh, another thing is that on the plain x-rays of the skull, you can get this hair on end appearance, which is characteristic of beta thalassemia. Um, and that's just demonstrated by this image here, where you can see um, all these little small white strands, um, and that's caused by widening of the uh, of a certain space in the skull. Uh, yes. 
see. And also some other investigations. Um, abdominal ultrasound scan, yeah, that will show hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, but these are not uh, these are not always done because the diagnostic test would be the HV electrophoresis. Um, but some other tests that you may consider, plain x-rays of the long bones, genetic testing, which is useful for um, determining, uh, screening your future family, uh, and HLA typing. So the management, I'm not going to go into this too much um, because I don't think you need to know too much, but the main bit, I guess, is yes, genetic counselling is important um, because you want your patients to know the chance that they'll pass it on to their children. Uh, and in terms of the other, tran the other um, treatments, it's mainly transfusion, so blood transfusions, just because they're anemic. Um, but the risk of blood transfusion is iron overload, and that's why it's normally given with, with um, iron chelation therapy. Um, and the only definitive treatment would be a stem cell transplant. Um, oh, also important to note in that beta foul major, uh, splenectomy is almost inevitable as hypersplen hypersplenism may develop from extramedullary uh, production of red blood cells. So on to the next one, it's alpha thalassemia. And it's very similar to beta thalassemia in that instead of decreased or absent synthesis of beta globin, uh, you get decreased absence synthesis of alpha globin. Um, yes, and the epidemiology is slightly different. Um, it's more southern um, Asia, China, Malaysia, and Thailand. And again, there's a few different um, genotypic variants uh, depending on how many of the alpha globin genes are affected. Um, so I could quickly talk through them. So. Silent carrier, um, you're normally asymptomatic you, because um, you're producing enough alpha globins because you still have three out of the four uh, genes. Alpha minor is slightly worse, you've lost two of them, um, so you can have some mild anemia. HBH disease is when you lose three or three of the globin genes are affected, and then that becomes more severe. And then alpha major or fetal hydrops, or hydrops fetalis. Um, it's normally incompatible with life because you're not producing any alpha globin chains at all. So, um, yeah, so like I said, trait is asymptomatic, HBH disease, um, you get moderate anemia, HB bots, normally results in death in utero. It's normally caused by high output heart failure and it's a result from the co-inheritance of uh, alpha thalassemia trait from both parents. And that's why genetic testing is quite important. Um, so the reason why um, it's incompatible with life is because you're getting a deficiency of alpha globins. Um, and therefore, all the, so fe for fetal hemoglobin, it's made out of two alpha and two gamma chains. If you don't have any alpha chains, these gamma chains are just going to polymerize together and form these tetramers. And these basically cannot carry oxygen. So uh, the, the baby will become hypoxic um, and yeah, die in utero. So, um, yeah, so talk about the clinical symptoms. Um, yeah, alpha traits asymptomatic. For HVH disease, there's a lot of clinical variability. They're normally anemic, but they do not normally need transfusions. Um, you can get hepatosplenomegaly, and um, you can get gallstones, bone deformities, and growth impairment. So this is, oh, sorry, this is a blood film. Um, and it is of a patient with HBH. And you can tell because as the characteristic, uh, these are called golf ball inclusion bodies or just called golf balls. And like I said earlier, um, when you get 
Yeah, yeah so um, you're deficient in alpha globins. So the beta globin chains uh, here form homotetramers and then these precipitate in the cell and it, it makes this golf ball appearance. So if you see this golf ball, it indicates HBH disease. Um, so yes, it will be a microcytic anemia on full blood count. And a similar presentation uh, on the peripheral blood smear, you get hypochromic microcytic red blood cells, um, characteristic golf ball appearance of HBH and reticulocyte count is raised. Um, and on HB electrophoresis, um, so on alpha trait, so depending on how severe uh, the alpha thalassemia is from alpha trait to HB bots, you get more and more mm -hmm. of this uh, hemoglobin bots, which will sh sh be shown on electrophoresis. Okay. Um, and yes, because you're lacking the alpha globin, which is needed for HBF, HBA, and HBA2, you get absence of this in HB bots and very high level of HB bots. And HB bots um, is the gamma tetramers, HBH is the beta tetramers. Um, the management is exactly the same as for beta fowl, um, meaning blood transfusions uh, with uh, iron chelation therapy. So um, the first question, just to check, everyone's listening, I believe it's posed. So the question is, George Bolling, now plans to it. So yeah, which finding on electrophoresis is most in keeping uh, with a two month old baby with beta thalassemia major? So I'll just let you guys vote. Um, yeah, you guys vote. Okay, um, I will end the polling uh, in five seconds, I guess. Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, yes. So, yeah, I'll oh, okay, share results. Okay, so the majority of people got it right. Um, the answer is B. And the way to remember this is basically beta thalassemia, you lack beta globins. Um, HBA is made of alpha and beta globulins. If you lack beta globulins, you have low HBA. Relative to this, uh, HBF and HBA2 would therefore relatively increase compared to the HBA. So that's how I remember it. Um, yeah, so the majority of you got it correct. Uh, let's see, stop share results. Exit, I think. And next question. Oh, yeah, so B. Okay. So next, uh, iron deficiency anemia, and yeah, we know the definition is deficient of deficiency of iron, um, and iron is required for basically the formation of hemoglobin, and that's why it causes uh, anemia when it's deficient. So let's see. Okay, so um, we could split the etiology into a few things: decreased iron intake. Um, so you're just taking less, and that can be due to diet or impaired absorption. Increased iron loss, which is normally caused by bleeding. Um, majority is from the GI tract, but also in females, menorrhagia. Uh, or you have increased iron requirements, so your body is using up the iron uh, faster than you're taking it in. And the common cause was infancy and pregnancy. Um, so some risk factors. Um, yeah, like I said, so pregnancy, uh, being vegan, uh, just because iron um, is in meat. Um, yeah, menorrhagia. Also, 
in, I'll say, uh, outside of the Western countries, hookworm infestation can be a, quite a common cause of iron deficiency anemia. So some specific signs. Uh, so coilinicia is quite a specific sign of iron deficiency. And that's basically spooning of the nails as demonstrated by this picture. Um, also glossitis here. Um, you can see it looks a bit inflamed, it's a bit red, and it's got this patch. Uh, and angular st stomatitis, or is also called angular colitis. And that's when uh, the edge of your lip um, gets inflamed. So, so iron deficiency anemia. Um, yes, there's microcytic anemia. Um, and again, you get microcytic and hyperchromic red blood cells. You get variation in uh, size and shape. That's why it's called anisopoikilocytosis. And you can also get these pencil cells. Um, which is caused by the variation. So I think I have a blood film on the next slide. Uh, and one key thing to note is also the reticulocyte, unlike in uh, the beta thalassemia and alpha thalassemia, the, reticulocyte, the reticulocyte count is low because the uh, bone marrow does not have enough iron to synthesize new red blood cells. Uh, yes. So, here we have two blood films, and one is normal. Um, I think the right one is normal. So this one is normal. Uh, you can see there's no, there's very little variation in size shape. They all look very similar. Well, here you can see there's a few odd ones. So here, here, here. So this is what we call the pencil cell. Um, it's particularly long and thin, and it's just, uh, it's basically a lip, an elliptocyte. So um, it's, it's just informally also called pencil cell, and that's just caused by the variation in size and shape. Uh, and here, if, if we compare this blood film with this one, you can see there's less red blood cells, hence there's anemia. You can also see um, the hyperchromia. You can see big white areas, while here they're very small. Um, so yeah, those are the main differences if you were to compare the two. Um, so if you did ferritinix, uh, blood ferritinix, you would find a low serum iron, a low transferrin saturation, and low serum ferritin. Um, and what's diagnostic of iron deficiency is less than 12 nanograms per mil of serum ferritin. However, the total iron binding capacity is increased, and that's because your body knows you're deficient in iron. So it, it increases the... Um, amount it can bind onto, so increases the amount um, it wants to take in because it knows it's low, so it increases the total iron binding capacity. Uh, let's see. Okay, yes, so, uh, well, if you're iron deficient, the basic treatment it would be iron supplementation. Um, I guess some side effects to note that may be important is it can cause uh, some abdominal pain or GI upset and black feces, which can often be mistaken for melina. Um, so if a patient does present with uh, black feces, it's important to ask if they're taking any iron. Um, so that's oral. Obviously, if you're more iron deficient, you can also get it uh, intravenously. Next, oh, so the next condition is anemia of chronic disease. Oh, so although I've classed this under microcystic anemia, there's a bit of overlap. It can also present as a normal cystic anemia, um, but it, it does fall into both categories. Um, so it's mainly due to inflammation mediated reduction in red blood cell production and sometimes in red blood cell survival. Um, it's actually very common. Um, just because anemia is secondary to a chronic disease. Lots of people have chronic diseases, so it's, it can be a common cause. Um, and the pathophysiology, so you have an inflammatory condition, so you up, it upregulates your cytokines, and that upregulates hepcidin synthesis and ferritin transcription. Uh, and these two proteins basically cause a decreased serum iron and then 
to, if you decrease an ion, you get a decrease of erythropoiesis. Um, so there's quite a few different chronic diseases that can cause it. I think the common ones in the exam, rheumatoid arthritis, um, is a common cause of autoimmune disorder. Um, and yeah, I've just listed a few chronic infections, acute infections, chronic diseases, malignancies. So yeah, lots of diseases can cause anemia. Um, yeah, so here I've wrote mild to moderate anemia because sometimes it's not, um, it can, the severity of the anemia may not be that bad. Um, platelet count may be increased um, because platelets increase uh, when there's infection or inflammation. Um, okay, so one of the key things, so in the ferritinics, serum ferritin is increased because it's an acute phase reactant. Uh, and these are uh, proteins that get increased uh, due to inflammation or infection. Serum ions reduce. Uh, total iron binding capacity can be normal or reduced. Um, remember, if we compare that with iron deficiency anemia, uh, the total iron binding capacity is increased in IDA um, and transferrin saturation is reduced. Um, some other tests, CRP and ESR, just because these are both markers of infection and inflammation, so you'd expect them to be raised. And the management, yeah, the management is more to treat the underlying disease because if you treat uh, what's causing the anemia, the anemia should also get better. But if it is symptomatic, you can consider giving red blood cells. Okay, so this is the next question. Um, let me see if I can pull. Is this? No. Sure Volume two. Okay, here. Yeah. So the question is which findings are most in keeping with iron deficiency anemia? Um, yeah. So I'll give that some time. Oh, wait, so there's quite, there's a variation. Let's see. Okay, uh, I'll give it what, 10 more seconds. I'll normally give a minute, I think. Okay, so I'm just going to end the polling. So the answer is the last one. Uh, oh, let me share the results. Okay, so I think it was quite close between four and five, but I'll just talk through them one by one. So in iron deficiency anemia, yes, you do get hyperchromic red blood cells, but you don't get reticulocytosis because you have low iron. Um, and so you get low reticulocytes because you need iron um, for, for red blood cell production. So that's why you get low reticulocytes. It's not B um, because yes, you do get low serum iron and low serum ferritin, but remember your body wants to get as much iron as possible. So you get a high um, total iron binding capacity. Uh, it's not C. So yes, you do get pencil cells, but again, you get a high TIBC, total iron binding capacity. And now that's quite close between D and E. Um, so in iron deficiency anemia, yes, you get hyperchromic uh, red blood cells, but you have a low transferrin and you have a low serum ferritin. You do not have a higher transferrin um, because your uh, iron levels are low. So therefore, uh, transferrin, which is kind of can carry iron, it will also be low um, because there's not that much iron to carry. Uh, e is correct. So yes, you get the pencil cells, which are ellipticides. Um, and you get the low transferrin, like I said. Yeah, so that explains why it answers E. Uh, let's see, stop sharing results. Next question, next, yeah, E. Okay, so we've gone through the microcystic anemias. So now we're 
um, briefly normal cystic anemia, there isn't too much. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. So let's close this. Okay, here I think I put this picture in just to show. Um, I think it's quite a common thing in examinations. Uh, we check, uh, we pull the eyelids down, and what we're actually looking for is subconjunctival pallor, and that's that, that was just to show you guys what it looks like. It's here. You can see it's it's, it's very white compared to this one, which is more normal. So yeah, that's the difference. Okay. Um, so normal cystic anemia. So this is when the mean cell volume is between 80 and 100. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, sorry, for microcystic anemia, the mean cell volume um, is under 80 and for macrocytic it's over 100. So um, yeah, that's how we remember it. So normal cystic is 80 to 100. And etiology is normally recent blood loss, but it can be due to a few things, bone marrow failure, renal failure. Renal failure because you um, get a decrease in EPO production, erythropoietin, so you get less red blood cells, and that leads to anemia. Or yes, like I said, there's overlap with anemia of chronic disease. And yeah, we know the symptoms of anemia, fatigue, palpitations, headache, uh, sometimes shortness of breath, and the signs, um, yeah. So. Um, I think the main things to know are mainly the microcystic and macrocystic anemias. Normal cystic anemias, um, the causes are not strictly hematological, they're mainly um, caused by other medical conditions. So yeah, blood loss, um, bone marrow failure, renal failure. Yeah. So macrocystic anemia. So like I said, um, I think I'll focus on the megaloblastic anemias and that's vitamin B12 deficiency and folate deficiency. And macrocystic anemia is when the mean cell volume is over 100. So B12 deficiency, um, the prevalence increases with advancing age. Um, some demographics and vegans, vegetarians, countries where um, there's not as much uh, meat intake. Also people who have had gastric bypass surgery. Um, and yeah, the pathophysiology. So it's the source of vitamin B12, meat, fish, and dairy. Um, and is absorbed in the terminal ileum, where it's bound to intrinsic factor, uh, and is important in DNA and myelin synthesis. Hence, why if you vitamin B12 deficient, um, you get less myelin synthesis, and that can present with neurological signs and symptoms. Um, so, I've put this in. Okay, so this is. I think I put this in because this is an aphthous ulcer in the mouth uh, and a common cause of aphthous ulcers would be Crohn's disease. Um, so that's an inflammatory condition that affects um, the GI tract from mouth to anus um, and it's a common cause of vitamin B12 deficiency because it can affect the terminal ileum. Yes, so Etiology, you can get a decreased intake of vitamin B12 if you're vegan. Um, and I, like I said, vitamin B12 absorption is dependent on intrinsic factor. So a condition which can affect intrinsic factor or gastric parietal cells which produce intrinsic factor is pernicious anemia. Um, and you get autoimmune atrophic gastritis. And that's why you get antibodies against the parietal cells or intrinsic factor. And then that leads to achloridia, which is basically a decrease in gastric hydrochloric acid production um, and get reduced intrinsic factor and therefore less vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, just some facts about pernicious anemia. It's usually in people who are over 40 and it's associated with people who are blood group A. I'm not quite sure why, but um, it's an association that, that um, has been studied. Um, some other associations with pernicious anemia is autoimmune diseases, so thyroid disease, um, Addison's disease, vitiligo, and also if you do have pernicious anemia, you do have a greater risk of gastric adenocarcinoma. Um, also, what may cause decreased intrinsic factors is post because you lose a portion of your stomach, 
So therefore you're losing some of your gastric parietal cells and therefore you're producing less IF. Um, and also we know vitamin B12 is absorbed in the terminal ileum. So like I said, Crohn's disease, um, ileal resection, maybe due to bowel cancer, um, uh, bacterial overgrowth, anything that affects the terminal ileum can cause reduced absorption of B12. So risk factors are basically already run through it. Yeah, yeah, old age, gastric surgery, chronic GI disease. Um, yeah. So some of the clinical features, yes, anemia, um, glycitis, sorry, I went through. So some neuro, so what distinguishes vitamin B12 deficiency from folate deficiency, I would say is neurological science. Um, so these can manifest as paresthesia, uh, peripheral neuropathy, and it's quite common, optic atrophy. And if it's very severe, you can get a condition called subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord. And this is more a neuro, um, well, a neurotopic, but it's usually only caused by pernicious anemia because you need a severe vitamin B12 deficiency. And I've listed some of the neurological signs you would find. Um, and you can read those uh, in your own time. Um, yeah. Oops. So uh, some bloods. Uh, so yes, anemic. Uh, you can, it can also affect your white cell count on playlists if it's severe. Um, you can do LFTs. You get, apparently, you can get a mild, uh, mildly elevated bilirubin and B12 or folate deficiency. Um, you can do thyroid function tests um, because you could have autoimmune disease, uh, hyperthyroidism, or hyper, hyperthyroidism, and that could be related to pernicious anemia. Of course, you could do serum B12 and folate. Um, that would tell you. So, in the blood film, what is key is hi these hypersegmented polymorphonuclear cells. Um, and we'll see it on the blood film, I think, on the next slide. And some more specific tests, um, you can yeah, test specifically for the intrinsic factor antibodies um, or parietal cell antibodies. And you could also do a celiac screen because that can also affect the terminal ileum. So, um, yeah, I've just included this blood film um, just to show you um, okay, firstly, you can see macrocytosis because here's a normal red blood cell and here's a macrocyte because it's much bigger. Um, this one's also much bigger. Uh, and also, but the main, the main reason I showed this is the hypersegmented uh, polymorphic nuclear cell. So it's mainly hypersegmented neutrophil. And this arrow is just pointing at a macrocyte. Um, it's in the oval shape, so it's an oval macrocyte. But if you see this, this is characteristic. Um, of megaloblastic anemia, this hypersegmented um, cell. So the management, um, yeah, so you basically re replace what you're deficient in. So um, that could be parenterally or orally, um, yeah. So the next is folate deficiency. Um, and I said megaloblastic anemia without signs of neuropathy it's the classic manifestation of folate deficiency. Um, it's quite common in countries uh, where cereal wheat-based products are not fortified with folic acid. Um, the source of folate is green, so green veg, legumes, nuts, um, and is absorbed in the proximal jejunum. So again, you can split its etiology into reduced intake, so poor diet, poor diet of leafy veg, uh, legumes, nuts, uh, increased demand, so such as in pregnancy, uh, which is why we give pregnant women uh, folic acid because they're at risk of folic deficiency. And then that can cause congenital conditions, uh, like spina bifida. Um, they can get malabsorption because I said it, uh, folate is absorbed in the proximal jejunum, so stuff affecting the GI tract. So again, celiac disease, Crohn's disease. Uh, and drugs can also affect uh, folate. So alcohol can, uh, phenytoin, methotrexate, some other common ones that can affect folate. Um, 
Yeah, so I've basically went through this. Yes, these are the risk factors. I've listed a few more drugs here. Um, anticonvulsants, um, what's this, anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, yeah. So some bloods. Again, similar, you would do RBCs, LFTs, TFTs, uh, serum B12 and folate. And again, you get the hypersegmented polymorphic nuclear cells. So from a blood film, it is not possible to differentiate between folate and B12 deficiency. Um, you would have to do a serum B12 or a serum folate, um, and the absence of neurological signs in folate deficiency would help point towards uh, yeah, folate deficiency. So again, the treatment, well, you would, if you're folate deficient, you give folate. However, um, we do normally give B12 first, unless the B12 level is known to be normal, um, because it may precipitate or worsen the subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord. So, okay, another question. Let's, oops, oh shit. <laughs> okay, another question. Polls. Next one, another check. Okay, so you have a child with history of seizures, presents with symptoms of tiredness and pallor. What's the most likely cause? So just let you guys um, do that question. Oh, so a lot of you have put malicious in here. Uh, did you think it was a neurological presentation? Okay, uh, I end up holding now. So the answer I was going for, oh, finish it. So the answer, um, share results. Okay, so most of you went for pernicious anemia. I think I know why, but the answer is medications. So what I was trying to get at is, as a child with history of seizures, it could be, I was trying to basically say epilepsy and a common uh, treatment for epilepsy can be phenytoin or any uh, anticonvulsant drug and remember this can affect folate, um, folate absorption and then that's how it can be a cause of megaloblastic anemia by folate deficiency but I think you guys chose E um, because you thought it was a neurological presentation in a child with anemia so you thought it was B12 deficiency and therefore pernicious anemia however I uh, pernicious anemia um, doesn't normally present in children. It normally presents in elderly people or adults, uh, at least like over 40. So it normally presents in adults. So the answer is C. Um, but I can see why some of you guys picked E. But in a child, pernicious anemia is not that common. Okay, so stop, share results, close. Next question, yeah. So there's medications caused by uh, those anticonvulsants, which can cause folate deficiency, which caused anemia. Okay, so the next I'm going to cover is hemolytic anemias. Uh, so the learning objective to understand the differentials and investigations for hemolytic anemia. Um, so hemolytic anemias can be split in a few ways. You can split it... Um, well, you can split it into intravascular and extravascular. Uh, acquired and hereditary, um, but here I've just chosen to focus on microangiopathic hemolytic anemia because that's the most commonly tested in exams from, um, well, from uni, when I was at uni. Um, so there's a spectrum of disorders. So hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenic syndrome, and DIC. Um, and I've just highlighted some common findings um, in hemolytic anemias in general. 
so reticulocytosis. Um, you can also get increased serum LDH, a decrease in serum haptoglobins. You get an increase in unconjugated bilirubin because you get increased breakdown of red blood cells of, and bilirubin is a byproduct. Um, and then I'll split some of these up into intravascular and extravascular. Uh, extravascular is normally direct uh, antibody test positive. Um, and that's normally characteristic of also immune hemolytic anemia. Uh, so let's go through some of the microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. So you have HUS, and uh, that is a triad of um, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, plus findings of low platelets and renal dysfunction. So it's normally in young children, and it's commonly seen in small clusters. Um, and a common cause is uh, the shigatoxin producing E. coli. Um, and that's because the shigatoxin produced by the E. coli binds to uh, glomerular cells in the kidney. And this basically causes cell damage and you expose the basement membrane. And when the basement membrane exposed, you're more likely to form microvascular clots. Um, and then these clots, um, basically when the red blood cells uh, are pushed through the capillaries uh, and meet these clots, clots um, it can cause destruction of these red blood cells. That's why you get fragmentation of roof sites. Um, and then you can also get the AKI because your the endothelial cells of the kidney are getting damaged. So risk factors, yep, ingestion of contaminated food or water, because that may contain the E. coli. Um, and the typical clinical features are fever, uh, bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and petechiae or papera. And I've just put in a picture of petechiae slash papera, yeah. And in terms of investigations and tests, so on the full blood count, yes, you'll find anemia, thrombocytopenia, uh, also increase in white cell count, leukocytosis, because you, uh, you, you get infection, echo infection. And on the blood smear, you're going to find schistocytes, which are fragments of red blood cells, because it is a hemolytic anemia, so red blood cells are getting destroyed. Um, and again, I've already mentioned this before, serum LDH gets increased. Um, in hemolytic anemia, serum haptoglobin gets decreased. It's DAT negative because this is not autoimmune. Um, this is cause, this is more mechanical um, because you get the, the red blood cells being pushed into the kidney uh, at high forces. And because basement membrane is exposed and you got microfrombi, it causes these red blood cells to break apart. Um, and you also get deranged use and ease, and that's because of the renal dysfunction. Um, yeah, and it would be good to do a stool culture because you can detect um, the shigatoxin producing E. coli there. So again, I've just put in a blood film um, just to show you some examples of schistocytes. So basically they're just parts, fragments of red blood cells that have been hemolyzed. So here and here. Um, so the red arrows are schistocytes. And this blue arrow um, was just an example of a microspherocyte. So you can see it's smaller than the red blood cells around it, hence micro. It's also basically, it looks very spherical, and the hence the spherocytes, it's microspherocyte, um, and which can be a finding um, on the blood films of, in HUS. Um, but a common, co a common characteristic finding is schistocytes. Um, so the management. So the first line is IV fluids. Um, IV fluids and ACE inhibitors help uh, protect the kidneys. Um, so it's for renal protection and red blood cells to treat the uh, anemia that's going on. Uh, some complications that you might get uh, can be neurological. Um, and you can also get cardiac dysfunction um, and intestinal complications.
Um, but I think most important here to realize is just the first line, um, because a lot of people don't realize ACE inhibitor is a treatment for HUS, but it's there for renal protection because you want to protect the function of the kidneys because it's the kidneys that's been targeted um, by the E. coli. Oops, let's see. Okay, so next is TTP from Bosic from both Cytopenic Papura. And the definition of this is basically a deficiency of a certain enzyme which cleaves von Willebrand factor. And the enzyme which cleaves von Willebrand factor is ADAM TS13. Um, so the pathophysiology, if you're deficient in ADAM TS13, um, you're gonna get a large buildup of von Willebrand and these von Willebrand um, multimers are released into the circulation and they can interact with platelets. And then you're basically causing an aggregation of circulating platelets um, at sites of high intravascular shear stress. So again, when the red blood cells are pushed through the capillaries and meet these aggregates of von Willebrand and platelets, um, they're getting fragmented. And that's why you get uh, microfrombi. Uh, some epidemiology. So it's more common um, in people of black ethnicities, more common in females. Um, yeah. Uh, so for uh, HUS, I mentioned the triad. So for TTP, there's a pentad. Um, this is the classical pentad, but in reality, it's very rare to have all five of these. Um, so you have the microangiopathic humanistic anemia, which you normally find with schistocytes uh, in the peripheral blood film, um, an increase in LDH, decrease in haptoglobins uh, in bloods. Get a thrombocytopenia, um, because remember all the platelets are getting used up to, to, um, by the von Willebrand factor. Uh, you also get neurological symptoms, which is key to T, uh, TTP, these neurological symptoms. As I've, vast variety of neurological symptoms, but I've listed the main ones, uh, headaches, confusion, uh, seizures. Uh, number four is fever, similar to HUS, and number five uh, is renal disease. Oh, sorry, number four is fever, um, which you can also find in HUS, but it's not part of the triad. Renal disease is part of the triad. Uh, renal disease or AKI. Uh, so that's common to both TTP and HUS. So I already went through some of the risk factors, um, but some of the clinical features, again, you can get papura, um, and that's because you're getting a deficiency of platelets, so you're more prone to bleeding. Um, papura is just basically like bruising, except is manifests as multiple small purple dots. Uh, you can get jaundice, and that's caused by uh, the increase in bilirubin, because remember, it's a hemolytic anemia, Bitterubin is a breakdown product, so you get increase in bitterubin in the blood. Uh, yes, neurological symptoms, so fever and GI symptoms. So in terms of investigations, yeah, full blood count, you'll find anemia, you'll find a thrombocytopenia, um, raised reticulate site count, DAT negative again, because it's not autoimmune, and then again, you do use any and you find renal dysfunction. Uh, and again, you find schistocytes on the peripheral blood sphere. Uh, so the management, so the management of TTP is slightly different because the pathophysiology of TTP is different to HUS. So while HUS can be caused by uh, like an E. coli infection, remember TTP um, was caused by a deficiency of Adam TS13, um, and the deficiency of Adam TS13 can be caused by antibodies against Adam TS13. And that's why the first line for TTP is plasma exchange or plasmapheresis to remove the antibodies um, and put the plasma back into the, to take the patient's plasma out, remove the antibodies, and then give the plasma back to the patient uh, with the antibodies removed. Uh, you can also give prednisolone. And second line is immunotherapy, final line splenectomy. But I think the main thing to know is the first line management plasmapheresis within 24 hours and prednisolone. Uh, so now further down the spectrum is DIC and has a multitude of causes. 
um, but you basically generate five ring clots, um, which use up a lot of your coagulation factors, a lot of your platelets, um, and then you become more prone to bleeding. Um, and also, so it may cause organ failure, consumption of plates. Yeah, that really result in bleeding. Um, yeah, I've just, I've just uh, included this diagram. So there's, DIC is always secondary to something else. And there's loads of things that can be secondary to, which I'll go through in the next slide. Um, but you get a systemic activation of coagulation, cask, uh, coagulation, consumption of your platelets, consumption of your coagulation factors. That's what causes the thrombocytopenia and coagulation factor deficiency, more prone to bleeding. You also get in lots of fibrin deposition caused by all this clotting. So you get this microvascular clots, and then depending on where the clots are, it will cause multi-organ failure. It's a quite a serious condition. Um, so I've listed a few causes of DIC, but I guess two of the main ones are sepsis and malignancy. Um, also, I guess if you're doing uh, ONG, uh, amniotic fluid embolism and placental abruption are also causes of DIC. But here I'll just focus on sepsis and malignancy, they're the main two um, in, in hospitals. Um, yeah, I've listed a few risk factors. So major trauma, burns, sepsis, obstetric conditions. Also, there's a subtype of um, AML called APML um, caused by um, basically it's genetic, it's a genetic condition, um, a subtype of AML, and it's related to DIC. Um, I don't think anyone will test you on that though. Um, yeah, and severe toxic or immunological reactions. Um, yeah, so in terms of clinical features, you have uh, features related to the underlying condition that's causing it. And again, you get signs related to uh, the type of thrombosis. Uh, so there's a few, there's purpura again, gangrene, acrocyanosis, which is per persistent cyanosis of the hands, feet, or face. You even get delirium or coma. Um, Ecchymosis is a more severe form of petechia. So instead of multiple small dots, you get a larger area um, of purple, so one large area of purple. Um, and the generalized bleeding, evidenced by at least three unrelated sites, is very suggestive of DIC. Um, okay, yes, so. Um, a diagnosis of DIC should be made based on appropriate clinical suspicions supported by the relevant lab tests. It's important to repeat tests to monitor the, the situation. So some of the tests we do. Um, yeah, a platelet count because you're going to get thrombocytopenic. Uh, you also specifically measure fibrin degradation products and D-dimers um, because these are both increased in DIC because you get these clots, um, which are made from fibrin, and when these break down, it releases uh, fibrin degradation products and D-dimers. PT and APTT is prolonged because you have a reduction in coagulation factors, so the time it takes uh, to clot will be increased. So you prolong PT and APTT. Um, fibrinogen, sometimes low because you're using it up, but can be normal. And again, in the blood film, you do get schistocytes. Um, and I guess less often done is antifrombin and protein C. So the management, the main management is to treat the underlying condition. Um, so if you treat DIC, it will, uh, so if you treat the primary condition that's causing the secondary DIC, um, that will help. But in terms of managing the hematological manifestation of DIC, um, it's basically about replacing what's lost. So you're from the cytopenic, so you can get a transfusion of platelets. Um, also, uh, you've used up all your coagulation factors, administration of uh, frozen fresh plasma, which is a mix of coagulation factors, will help as well. 
Okay, yeah. I don't, I don't think you need to know too much about the management, but um, I've just listed basically platelet replacement, FFP replacement. So another question. Let's so. Okay, so this is the next question. Yeah, I think this one, well, I think a lot of you just saw the answer accidentally. Um, but yeah, we can go through this question as well. So I just give 10 more seconds. Okay. Oh wait, people are still voting. Okay, I'll end polling uh, in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. End polling. Okay. So yeah, the majority have put plasmapheresis, which is correct, um, because this is TTP. So you've got the neurological symptoms. That's why I just put GCS12. Uh, you have the abdominal pain, um, you have nausea and vomiting, you have a fever, and you have easy bruising uh, due to uh, the thrombocytopenia. And again, the first line treatment is plasmapheresis, as I mentioned before. Um, prednisolone, you can also, can, you can um, also, can also be a treatment in combination with plasmapheresis, but the main treatment is plasmapheresis. Um, yeah. So stop the results. Exit. Yeah. So now I'll briefly go through polycythemias. Um, so the definition of polycythemia is a high hematocrit. So it's a bit the opposite of anemia. Um, we have a low hemoglobin, you will have a high hemoglobin here. Um, and uh, in men, um, it's not point, over 0 0.52 on two separate occasions, uh, or 0 0.48 in women on two separate occasions, or you can have one-off readings of hematocrit. Um, so you can classify polycythemia into apparent and true. For apparent, you don't really have a true increase in the number of red blood cells. It's more you have a decrease in plasma volume, um, so you get uh, increase in concentration of red blood cells, which is what hematocrit is. Uh, and then you have true polycythemia where you truly do get increase in the number of red blood cells. And again, this can be split into primary polycythemia, which is polycythemia vera, and secondary polycythemia. So for polycythemia vera, um, you have a genetic mutation uh, which results in uh, inappropriate red blood cell proliferation independent of erythropoietin production. For secondary, um, you have increased lumbar red blood cells and that's because you have increased erythropoietin. The source of the erythropoietin uh, can be endogenous, so produced by your body naturally, or exogenous, um, well, such as Lance Armstrong when he used EPA. Um, and if it is uh, pathophysiologically raised, if EPO is pathophysiologically uh, raised due to hypoxia, um, sorry, sorry. So EPO can be raised. So EPO um, can either be endogenous or exogenous. If it's endogenous, um, it can be secondary physiologically to hypoxia, or it can be pathological, uh, such as autonomous EPO production caused by um, like a renal, renal, renal tumor, clear cell tumor. Okay, so I've kind of went through some of this. Yeah, so apparent polycythemia. Um, high BMI, heavy smoking, exactly opposition. Um, but for polycythemia vera, the mutation that, cause, that causes this red blood cell proliferation um, 
independent of EPO is a JAK2 mutation. And again, yeah, I've went through second polycythemia. So some of the clinical features, actually in the majority of patients are asymptomatic, um, but in exam questions, uh, they do like to put some features of thrombosis. So they might describe uh, shortness of breath, uh, increased respiratory rate, uh, pain in the lower calves, so P and DVT, chest pain, MI, stroke. Um, so you can get neurological symptoms from stroke. Uh, some common ones are specifically pruritus or itchiness evoked by contact with warm water and tenderness or burning sensation in fingers and toes, which is called erythromyalgia. Um, you can also get redness of fingers and toes, uh, splenomegaly, plethora. But yeah, commonly in exam question, it'll say headache, fatigue, and itchiness caused by contact with warm water or burning sensation caused by contact with warm water. And that, that is um, polycythemia. So there's some investigations. So you have to get smoking history and check for history of thrombosis. Uh, in terms of full blood count, uh, yep, you get a raised uh, HB in men and in women, raised hematocrit. You can also get raised platelets. Uh, some more specific tests, you could do JAK2 mutation testing if you think it's polycythemia vera uh, and you've excluded um, uh, high EPO. So that's why you do a serum EPO level. Um, and you can do renal and liver function tests to see if the renal function is deranged, possibly by a tumor or cancer. Um, yeah. So for management, um, so you can manage lifestyle factors, smoking, diabetes, cholesterol, hypertension, alcohol. Uh, for polycythemia vera, um, what we normally give is aspirin uh, to reduce the chance of uh, blood clots. Uh, also regular venous sections, which is basically when you, you just take blood from the patient because it's so high in patients, you just, uh, you just remove blood from the patient, usually performed every six to 12 uh, weeks. Um, and some rarer treatments, uh, hydroxycarbamide um, for patients with raised platelet count and or marked leukocytosis. Um, for apparent polycythemia and some patients with secondary polycythemia, again, venous section, um, but you never use hydroxycarbide in these patients. Oh, let's see. So I think this is the last question. So you have a patient who presents with acute right upper quadrant pain, hepatomegaly, distended abdomen, and the blood shows polycythemia. Okay, so a few more seconds. Okay, so most of you have picked Bud-Chiari syndrome, which is correct. Um, let me just share the results. Yeah, so most of you picked Bud-Chiari syndrome. So the patient has um, polycythemia, and we know polycythemia is associated with increased risk of clots. So you kind of need to know the pathophysics or what Bodhikari syndrome is. Bodhikari syndrome is basically uh, thrombosis of the hepatic vein. Um, and that commonly presents with acute right upper quadrant pain, hepatomegaly, and a distended abdomen. And that's why the answer is Bodhikari syndrome. I know some people picked um, 
hepatocellular carcinoma, but that doesn't, so that doesn't normally cause pain. And um, yeah, that doesn't normally cause pain. And, but you can get hepatomegaly and you can get a distended abdomen, but it's not usually associated with polycythemia either. Um, but Budkiari syndrome is because it's a thrombotic condition. So that's why the answer is E, Budkiari syndrome. Okay. Uh, close this. Okay, so the takeaway message. Oh, I just realized this was quite a long um, t uh, tutorial, sorry. Um, but we've gone through some of the common anemias. But, uh, we've gone through some of the hemolytic anemias, especially uh, the microangiopathic ones and the polycythemias. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for uh, listening in um, to the tutorial. I know it can't be easy, like 7 p.m. on a Wednesday, um, but thank you guys. And if possible, please give me feedback. It would be really helpful for future presentations. Um, and let me check if there's any questions actually. Um, but yeah, this is the uh, feedback. Any questions? Let's see. Uh, Okay, okay, so there's a few. So why'd you get, so that was at 716. Why'd you get hepatic splenomegaly? I think that would be for beta thalassemia. Okay, so why'd you get hepatic splenomegaly? Okay, so the reason you get hepatic splenomegaly in beta thalassemia, so, um, let's see. So you, you, your production of red blood cells is impaired. Um, and then because of that, you get extra medullary production of red blood cells. Um, and these sites uh, where extra medullary production takes place can be the liver, spleen, um, and that increases the size of the liver and spleen, and it could also be the bones, um, and that's why you get the frontal and parietal bossing. Uh, so it's mainly because of extra medullary erythropoiesis. Okay, why do we get golf inclusion body? So that's for HBH. Um, so HBH is when three out of the four uh, alpha globin genes are affected. Um, let me just. Oh, wait, is someone messaging? Okay. Yeah, when three out of the four uh, globin gene, sorry, three out of the four alpha globin uh, genes are affected. And I believe tetramorphosis. Okay, and because we know HBA is made out of two alpha globins and two beta globin chains, because you're deficient in HBA, the beta globin chains start to uh, bind together. So instead of two alphas and two betas, you get four beta chains together. And then these four beta chains, they're insoluble and they precipitate within the cell, within the red blood cells. And when they precipitate within the red blood cell, it causes these, you can see the precipitates uh, on the peripheral blood smear. So all of these little dots, which make up this golf ball appearance, um, is what makes the is what makes the um, golf ball appearance in HBH. Yeah. Okay. So what is achloridia? Okay. So achloridia is basically reduced um, HCl production um, in the tummy, in the stomach. That's what achloridia is. Re reduced production of HCl or acid, reduced acid production in the stomach. What else would suggest a hookworm infection? So hookworm, I don't know if everyone's still listening, but hookworm is a parasite. So, oh, is it? 
Oh, do I have to ask? Oh, is this how? Sorry. Okay, so hookworm is a parasite, and um, what's raised in parasite infections is eosinophils. So if eosinophils are raised with anemia, that's quite uh, in a patient who kind of meets the demographic, um, not in a Western country, of hookworm infections, that would suggest um, yeah, a parasitic infection, and then a hookworm would be a common cause of that. Why is serum ferritin increase in anemia of chronic disease? Okay, so when we get uh, infection or inflammation, certain proteins in our blood get increased, and these proteins are called acute phase uh, reactants. Ferritin is an acute phase reactant, and that's why when we measure serum ferritin, an anemia of chronic disease is raised because the anemia is secondary normally to inflammatory or, or infection type condition. So therefore, the acute phase proteins are raised, and therefore ferritin is raised as, as it is an acute phase protein. CRP is also one. That's why CRP is also raised. Um, yeah. Why do you get hypersegmented polymorphic nuclear cells in megaloblastic anemia? So I'm not too sure about this, but I believe it's something to do with um, the fact that vitamin B12 and folate are needed for normal um, production of neutrophils. So when I say polymorphic nuclear cells, they're normally neutrophils, so it's hypersegmented hyper neutrophils. Um, so I guess when there's a deficiency in B12 or folate, um, you just get abnormal segmentation um, of the of the of the in inner bit of the neutrophil. Hi, I'm doing I'm doing imperial is hematol competitive choice. Oh, oh cool. Okay, so yeah, so I did hema imperial too. Um it's not really relevant to this lecture, but it was really fun. It's not I don't think it, it's not it wasn't competitive when I did it. Um and you learn a lot of in-depth hematology and I thought it was really well organized. But when I did it, I think it was different to I think it's been changed. Um, so I can't say how it is recently. I did it two years ago, um, but it was really, it was like a really good experience. Can you not use homocysteine and MMA to check whether it's folate or B12? Um, I'm not sure about this, but from what I understand, homocysteine and MMA are um, quite specific tests you use normally for rare pediatric uh, metabolic conditions. So like homocysteine urea, um, I think some is it sweet, I can't remember the other one, um, but they're normally used for rare pediatric conditions. They're not commonly used at all, um, mainly because you can just check folate and B12 uh, directly instead of having to use uh, other markers. Um, sorry, I'm just I'm, I'm just clicking through. Why is MCHC a decrease in hemolytic anemia? Uh, where's that? Folate hemolytic anemia. Did I say that? MH. Hemolytic anemia. No, oh, decrease means so from decrease variations. I think mean cell here. I'm a bit unsure about this one. I need to double check. Where's mean cell? Let me see. MCHC. So it's dividing the hemoglobin on the hematocrit. We've got reduced hemoglobin. I guess you have an increased hematocrit. Um, so, so MCHC is basically the hemoglobin concentration. Um, you have a reduction in hemoglobin. Um, and I think the hematocrit is the same. So, so basically MCHC is hemoglobin divided by hematocrit. If hemoglobin is reduced and 
um, hematocrit stays the same, then MCHC will go down. So I guess that's why it's decreased. And last one, why do antivirals such as... Oh, I think this was a recent... There was a recent publication about the use of antifibrinolytic agents. Increase the risk of thrombotic characteristics in the IC. Antifibrinolytics. Um, increase the risk of thrombotic. Oh, from boss complications in the IC. So, if, and, so I'm guessing if it's anti-fibrinolytic, clots will not be broken down. So therefore you have increased thrombosis and therefore your risk of thrombotic complications will increase. That's, that's just um, using my, just my understanding of hematology, why you would get increase in thrombotic complications if you use uh, antifibrinolytic agents because you get increase in clots because they're not being broken down because um, that's what TXA does it stops clots from being broken down it's antifibrinolytic so therefore you'll get more clots uh, more clotting complications okay I think that's all the questions um, yeah I think that's the end okay